We've looked at the truth about the truth. That's kind of where the whole series started, the truth about the truth. And that's this. It's not like in need of revision or, or anything. It, it is the truth. Amen? Amen. And heaven and earth are going to pass away, but what happens to this? Uh, nothing happens to this. Uh, this remains uh, forever. Heaven and earth pass away, but my word will never pass away. And so I, I spoke about the truth, the truth about the truth as this series began. And then uh, secondly, we looked at some examples of folks that were giving Jesus the Heisman. If you can imagine, they were literally like giving him in his earthly ministry the Heisman, you know, sort of like speak to the hand, my heart isn't here, my heart isn't interested, and, and uh, learned as much as we could from those examples. We had a great Father's Day message on not shanking it, don't shank it. You want this thing balanced straight down the middle. And, uh, and then last weekend, if you were here, uh, boy, what a doozy that was. Last weekend, we talked about the inerrancy of sex. The inerrancy, uh, the inerrancy of sex. Took on the whole homosexual uh, lifestyle and agenda and, and just kind of really spoke love into being our agenda for those that are stiff-arming God over that a particular issue, and I can't thank you enough for your prayers uh, and your support and all of that. I mean, wow, woo, it was a biggie, and uh, Discovery Channel picked up part of the message I heard. I don't know exactly what that means or where it's going to go, but uh, just speaking the truth, I thought it was probably good to give that message before it's illegal and I get thrown in jail and arrested. So um, that was um, last weekend, and um, uh, and a lot of mail on that. It was good, good hearing from you and good having your way in. And I know a lot of you uh, have heavy hearts over that particular issue and how it affects you and your life and your loved ones. And uh, did my best with it. And today also uh, a, a, real, a real serious one. Glad you're here for it. Um, welcome now, I think part five. Some of you, this is your first time here. You're like, I don't know where to park. I don't know where to go. We've been here all summer. And you're like, oh. <laughs> so uh, welcome, and now we're here for uh, a, a look at what the skeptic's kryptonite would be. What do you think it is, the skeptic's kryptonite? I mean, Superman had it all going for him until he was confronted with kryptonite, and then he just buckled, then he was just weak. It just sort of zapped him of all of his Superman powers and rendered him useless, and I'm curious, what would the kryptonite be for your friends that are stiff-arming God? Maybe even more than stiff arming, they're like outright giving him the finger saying, I am not interested in anything that you would have to say to me. So what would the kryptonite be where their argument is concerned that would just buckle them at the knees and render their argument uh, useless? And that's what I want to share with you uh, this morning together as we jump into God's word and we'll celebrate communion and uh, in, enjoy the, the rest of this glorious day. Now, be praying over those prayer cards, all right? This was cool. Love the fact that we're a praying church. Anyone say amen to that? Amen. How about everyone says amen to that? Amen. amen. We're a praying church, and so we got kids on their way to camp, uh, on the way to Hume, and so kids who didn't make it to camp, you're in with the old guy today. Welcome. Uh, I'll try and keep you uh, entertained and, and uh, awake, but... Um, uh, Back at it next weekend for our youth ministries once they return to camp. And just praying they have a life-changing week uh, up at Hume. This is where God got a hold of me. And uh, a lot can happen at camp. It's where I got saved. It's where I met my wife. A lot can happen at camp. Uh, it's where my son met his wife. It's where my daughter met her husband. A lot can happen at camp. You ought to be praying about this week. Uh, be praying about this week at camp. And then we had a ton of kids who got back. Uh, from camp last week in our Club 56 up at Forest Home with Daniel and with Ellis. Great to see Ellis and, and, uh, and a great time up there. And yesterday uh, was homeless. We had our homeless outreach downtown and 20 some of you odd went down with Pastor Sean. And hey, if you haven't done that, you ought to sign up and do that. It's just an awesome, awesome time of outreach and ministry. And that was great. And we had a Mexico team yesterday, went down to Mexico and we're helping a church, one of our sister churches down there, Horizonte. Hey, hey. Uh, they've outgrown their place, completely outgrown their place. Their Awana ministry is exploding, and so we're helping them find some land, uh, as well as the ongoing monthly ministry that takes place down at Mexico. Now, that always fills up, too, but you ought to go. You ought to sign up and, 
and be a part of that uh, ministry. Is I just love that we're a church that's doing stuff. I mean, it's just, it's just it's awesome. And so we prayed a couple weeks ago, if you were here, with Stuardo and Marlene. They're from Guatemala, and we've sent them down. You guys were all gracious and, and uh, generous and supportive. So we've flown them down. They're representing all of us and just getting a lay of the land of the towns and the homes and the families that were devastated by the volcano, right, down in Guatemala. So we'll be praying for them. They're on their mission trip representing all of us. And then Gary and Leslie, they were in the 9 o'clock sitting right here. They're off to Africa uh, this week. They're off to Nairobi. And they'll literally, no exaggeration, be ministering to thousands uh, with the Horizon team that's going with them to Africa. And so they're on their way. So be praying for them. Be praying for the sanctuary the sanctuary is coming along. It's why we're here, because we've gutted it over there. It's completely gutted. The, the, uh, the, the ceiling's gone, drop ceiling's gone, the soffit's gone, the fluorescent lighting. Hallelujah, the fluorescent lighting, gone. Some of you used to go in that sanctuary, and you literally would have to find a light to sit under in order to read your Bible. Problem solved, uh, gone. New lighting coming in, new sound system coming in. Doesn't mean it's louder, just means it's better. It's a lot better, but we got a lot of work to do, and, and, and Richard Brown is doing an awesome job. Richard's right here. It's a fantastic, awesome job, incredible, and Tim Whitcomb and, um, and, and Zach and so many guys. I'm telling you what, so blessed, and lunch is showing up every day, so if you want to come, and, and uh, in fact, we need framers. We need framers this week, so if you know how to frame... We could really use you this week because Mitch is off to camp and, and Willie's, uh, Willie's somewhere. I don't know where Willie's, Willie's gone. And, uh, and Richard's here, but we need some framers. Um, so if you want to put on a belt and frame, uh, we could use you. We're putting up some walls and finishing some things out. And then uh, we're pretty much on schedule, uh, Lord willing, on schedule to be back over there the first week of August. So we'll still be over here for a month. All right, and then over there, uh, hopefully move back in the first weekend of August. Whether we're moved in or not, we'll be on that side of the campus once again, because uh, we got to free this thing up for the school that it is. And uh, so we'll do VBS in here, be praying for that. The, the, the castle scene, you know, we're like slaying the dragons this year. And so we got a castle set that's coming into this room over the course of the next couple weeks. We'll do church in here and VBS in here, and the and the castle stage goes from that wall to that wall. Literally, it's huge. And like 600 kids, amazing. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. But if you can help us with any of that, if you know how to frame, uh, if you don't know how to frame, don't fake it. Don't be like, I, I can frame. You know if you can frame or not. If you can't, bring lunch. <laughs> bring lunch for the framers, and we could really use you. It's coming along. It's uh, super awesome, uh, really, really cool, great to see um, really all that the Lord is doing, and, um, and thank you for your prayers, thank you for your prayers and support, we're spending a lot of money over there to make it fresh and innovative and new and digital and greater and better, and just hoping we could, you know, scope the thing out and reach a whole new sector of, of San Diego uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, so, so be praying about that, and um, and, and, and let's look, look at this together. Look at, look at, sec, look at Second Peter with me. Um, I love what he says here. In verse 12, he says this. Look at Second uh, Peter chapter 1, first chapter of Second Peter, verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent. I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know, some of you are here and you're like, I already know. I, what, what's he going to say today? I already know. Well, you might know, but uh, it's good to be reminded. That's what Peter's saying. And don't ever think that you know it all. You're not going to know it all until you're there. Here we see through a glass dimly, but then face to face. So don't ever peek. Don't ever be like walking in and say, I already know it all. Yeah, I'm like a ninth grader. I know it all. Shut up. You don't know it all. I mean, just knock it off. Don't ever think you know it all. Because then it's just going to like stop the learning right? So be a sponge, be soaking it in, be growing with us in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if you've ever wondered, how do I pray for you, Bob? I mean, that was intense last weekend, what you did. 
And uh, how can I pray for you, right? I mean, because uh, Satan hates what we did together last weekend. I mean, he hates this whole thing. He wants skeptics to become more skeptical. He didn't want any kryptonite that's kind of weakening their argument or agenda. And as awesome as the week it was, I mean, we're getting another conservative judge on the bench. Awesome. So, but listen, here's the point. Yeah, it's great. Hallelujah. But we're not putting our faith in judges. We're not putting our faith and trust in the Supreme Court or in a governor for the state of California. I'm sorry. We're putting our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter writes and he says, I can't be found negligent in these things. So here's how you can pray for me. Bob, how can we, how can we pray for you? We got this prayer card going of all these kids that were at camp. And here's, here's what's cool about you as a praying church. We had to print off 500 more cards after the nine o'clock service. Because I told them, I said, I don't want any more cards around here after the services are done and the kids are at camp. In fact, I want the 11 o'clock, here's exactly what I said at the 9, I want the 11 o'clock showing up going, oh, sorry, all the prayer cards are out. We had to print out 500 more cards. Because some are taking stacks, they're like, I'm not just praying for one, I'm going to pray for 15 kids this week. Awesome! Here's how you can pray for me. That I would not be, what's Peter say? Negligent. Oh, I'm praying. PB, I'm praying for you that you would not be negligent. Just like what Peter says, not negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Let's keep at it, you guys. Let's not water it down. Let's not go soft. There's plenty of churches, right? I got some mail this last week that thought I went too light on the gays. No, I think we're here to love, not judge. Too much judging, we need more love. They've been jacked up with a misinterpretation of what love's all about. We need to bring them back and show them what genuine, true love is. The Bible says kindness is what leads people to repentance. All right, that's pretty judgmental to say, oh, you went too soft on them. Okay, listen, I don't want to be negligent to remind you of the truth. Even though you know, I want to remind you of these things. And I love what he says. Look at verse 13. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up. That's why I'm here to stir you up. I don't want you leaving the same. I'm going to stir you up today. <laughs> I'm going to stir you. Peter's like, to stir you up by reminding you. And then he goes on. Look at verse 14. He says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. What's that mean? What's that mean? I'm going to die. Knowing that shortly, and I'm like, shortly, Lord, shortly? Not too shortly. I want grandkids. <laughs> no one's cooperating with this program yet where my kids are concerned, but I want some grandbabies. So shortly, I, I know, like, we, we got very little time left. Shortly, he goes, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus showed me. Remember what the Lord Jesus showed him? He's like, uh, yeah, Peter, you're going to die like I'm about to die. And when that, oh, this is a, when that day came for Peter to die the way the Lord Jesus died, what did Peter say? Peter said, I'm not worthy to die the way that my Lord Jesus died. So take my crucifixion cross and do what with it? Do what with it? Flip that thing upside down. I'm going to be crucified upside down. So he knows his time is short, and he says, I don't want to be negligent to continue to stir you up and, and to remind you. Look at verse 15. We're just doing four verses today. Just four. You're like, wow, I think we'll be out early. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Uh, Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So, uh, what's he wanting to remind us of? I mean, this is a great reminder here, 2 Peter chapter 1. I mean, he's like that you, that you would stay steadfast in what you know. And I just want to make sure that you know what you know. That it could really be lived out before a watching world. This word for know is the word ado. It doesn't mean just to know it up here. It means you've experienced it. You're now an eyewitness of seeing how Christ can transform a life. That's what he means. He's not like just some cerebral, I took a class, I know, I know, I know, I know, no. You've experienced what he's talking about, and you know that time is short. 
And the last thing you want to do is be negligent. The last thing you want to do is waste it. You want to really make sure that your life now is lived in the certainty of who Christ is. Because here's the point. Our certainty is their kryptonite. Think of that equation. Our certainty about these things, our confidence in these things is the skeptic's kryptonite. And, listen, what we aren't certain about isn't. If we're like waffling, well, I don't really know. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm living for. I I don't really know. Then our life isn't a kryptonite to the skeptic's agenda. It's actually fodder for their agenda. It's actually ammunition for them to remain and even become more skeptical if we're kind of like, I don't know. But if you're certain about it, as Peter is wanting you to be certain about it, reminding you of what you know, stirring you up so that every day is not wasted but used for the kingdom and glory and and honor of, of, of the Lord. Our certainty in these things, you guys, it becomes the skeptic's kryptonite. So here's his point in these four verses. Here's his point. The thesis of it is simply this. We have an awesome God. Amen, 11 o'clock? Amen? We have an awesome, we have a great God. And the win for us, here's the win. The win is to win them back to the greatness of our God. They've wandered off. They've bought into the lie of this system, of this world. And our big win Our big buy-in to the win of why we're here is winning the world back to the awesomeness of our God. Okay, I want to know how we're doing with this. How are we doing in winning back a skeptical world? Because the Bible tells us the fool says in his heart there is no God. And Peter's like, "Uh, but you know, you know. But the fool doesn't know. The fool says in his heart there is no God. The, The fool today with a growing agenda of skepticism is questioning the historicity of jesus christ questioning the resurrection questioning your faith questioning a changed life questioning the power of the truth of the word of god questioning dna i mean if there was anything dropped in your lap in our lifetime that would prove that we come from an intelligent designer it's dna it is awesome that gift to us in our argument of the factuality and truth that we are created in the image of God. But they'll still question it because the fool says in his heart there is no God. They can question creation all they want, but you know, right? You know. You know the truth. Okay, so what are we doing with what we know? Do we really know what we know? I'm not playing to the base today. Nor on the other extreme am I just tickling your ears. I'm saying, how do we know what we need to know in order for the certainty of our faith to become the kryptonite of the skeptical's heart of foolishness that says there is no God? C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis just continues to rock my world in amazement of his brilliance. I was in his house a year ago in Oxford, sat in his study, sat in the chair at his desk, and I think it's on page 140, he says this. He says this in Mere Christianity. He says, faith, check this out. Faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. Okay, that's brilliant. Because you'll wake up with the challenges that we all wake up with. I I don't know, Bible this morning or beach this morning? I don't know, Bible or brunch? I mean, I don't know if I'm in the mood. He's like, faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. For moods will change. Whatever view your reason takes. I know this by experience, says Lewis. Look what he says. Now that I'm a Christian... I do have moods in which the whole thing looks improbable. Okay, that's honest. That is like like a moment of brilliant honesty. Have you ever been that honest? There are times in my 
pursuit of the things of God. There are times, Lewis says, where the whole thing looks improbable. But when I was an atheist, look what he goes on to say, when I, and he was a full-blown raging atheist that was actually out to disprove the existence of God when he got saved. And Tolkien played a huge part in the conversion of C.S. Lewis. Tolkien. Two Towers, Tolkien. Hobbit, Tolkien. Like, like, he says, when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. That's rad. I mean, and that, that's rough if you're an atheist today because you're like, eh, it might be true. He said, when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. That's why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you teach your moods where they get off. That is like so relevant, you guys. That's so current. It's like he said it just now. Unless you teach your moods, your moods up and down, roller coaster at the fair, unless you teach your moods where they get off, get off the bus. Get off the plane. Disembark, you moody self. Listen, unless you tell your moods where they get off, you will never either be a sound Christian or even a sound atheist, but just a creature dithering to and fro with its beliefs dependent on the weather or state of its digestion. Consequently, one must train the habit of faith. That's what we're doing right now, okay? We need to train the habit of faith. That's what Peter means. And Peter says, pray for me. I don't want to be negligent to stir you up, to remind you of what matters most where this life is concerned. So the point of the text here in Peter is simply this. What he's wanting to bring to bear is that your faith needs to be transformational. Okay, not just informational. The word for know, again, isn't just to know it up here but so that it so impacts your heart and life and destiny and plans and purposes for your entire remaining however many days there is. He's like, uh, not many for me. I'm like, Lord, I hope there's some for me. I don't think we're quite done yet. We got a few more buildings to build and we got things to do with the sanctuary and the plans and the grandbabies. Right? I mean, do you have a plan? We had a plan. We got married, right? And the plan wasn't to have kids for a while. Because I was like, Vaughn, I'm, I'm, I'm building this church. I've been at it for 32 years at Horizon. That's a long place to be in one place. That's 32 years. I mean, Jesus was only here 33. I'm sort of like, whoa, 32. And I started coming because my wife girlfriend at the time was sending me these cassette tapes. Do you remember cassette tapes? She's sending me these tapes of this guy at Horizon at the North Park Theater and was like, wow. Makes it so real. And that was Pastor Mike, Mike McIntosh. And then he married us in 88 and been here ever since. Started down there at the Claremont campus right after they had moved from the North Park Theater at Hale Junior High School. And then we had a dream about a North County campus. Started at the Del Mar Hilton with 60 people. I just look at all that the Lord has done. He's blown my mind. I mean, his plans so much greater than our own plans. It's been amazing. Like there's got to, there, 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 there's, there, there's, there's, there's more. And I just don't want the more for me or for you, for any of us. I don't want the more to be wasted. Do we end up finding or like spinning our wheels or we got derailed somewhere? Something happened along the way and the passion that we once had in our heart for the things of the Lord and, 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 and the power of his word. I mean, how do you keep that? I get asked this all the time. How do you keep that passion from growing dormant so that your life remains the kryptonite that it's meant to be for a questioning, skeptical world that surrounds us? It's by your faith being transform not just information but transformation through repentance and holiness and christ-likeness and a 
impact that we're making on our world and the witness that we're called to be and not hiding our light under a bushel, but letting it shine. Let me give you three ways, three ways today that it needs to be brightly shining more now than ever before. I gave you one last weekend and it was love. It was loving, 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 loving people. Let me add three to them this week. So we covered loving. We looked at it. If you weren't here, it's online. Grab it. We're like, like looking specifically at that audience that is raised and, and, and discussed last time. Let me add to it today. Three more ways. By our living, jot these down. Add them to your prayer card. By our living, by our giving, and by our forgiving. I think three radical ways that Peter would weigh in and want for us to take note of the fact that the way in which our faith transforms us is through our loving last weekend. This weekend, our living, giving, and forgiving. Let's look at them one at a time real quick. Our living. In other words, living to what intent? What's the intent? What's the intent of your living right now? Maybe you're like, ah... Uh, Dude, I'm in high school. I'm only in this room because youth isn't meeting, and my intent is just to have fun. Okay, let's, like, let's weigh that out. What ultimately, if we could just scratch under the surface of fun, is the intent of our lives. From high school, maybe you're home from college, and you're getting pounded by the skepticism of your secular university audience, both in the dorm as well as in the classroom. And you're like, I, okay, let's talk about it. How radical are you for Jesus Christ on your high school campus, on your college campus, in your workplace, in your neighborhood? Do people even know? How radical are we in our living? And could we turn that up knowing that time is short? Peter's like, I'm about out of here, I'm about out of here. So could we turn it up? Because listen, listen, I don't know if you've ever done the correlation, but turning it up actually turns the skepticism down. If it's our certainty and confidence in the power, transforming power of the work of Jesus Christ, if that's their kryptonite, could the way you're living this out be turned up? Like, what if we together just got on fire for the things of Jesus Christ? More into it than ever before. Because I'm telling you, the more we're into it, the less they have to be skeptical about. You got to begin to see that correlation and how it affects not just your life, but the people surrounding your life. Like a rock that's thrown in a pond and the rippling effect that washes up on every shore. The more we live this out, the more our life becomes kryptonite to the skepticism. Okay, so what if we turned it up? What if, you know, they're living their life loud and proud? Are we? Honestly, are we? That loud and in love and proud of, of who we are and what Christ has done for us. And, and if we kind of turned the volume up on that, what would it do? I'll tell you what it would do. It would buckle the arguments that come from a skeptical world. I, I was speaking at a conference. Bond was with me. We were speaking at this thing and uh, it was, you know, packed out like a room like this and and uh, a lineup of speakers, I was honored to be included. Rick Warren was there, Francis Chan was there, and, and my time to speak was coming up, I think, uh, on the next day. And we were, we were in there, we were sitting, we were sitting like right back there, like right there, that's an awesome seat, right where you're sitting, that's where I was sitting. And in front of us, like three rows in front of us, uh, was another uh, group of people sitting, and this guy's up, this renowned guy, awesome teacher of the word at the conference was doing what I'm doing right now, a Bible open, preaching, pouring it out. And right in front of us, like right there, this gal starts knitting. Knitting. Not while I was teaching. Not while, not while I, I would have thrown something at her. She starts knitting while he's doing this. Do 
yeah, well, you know, we're busy, Bob, and we'll come when we can, and if we have a chance, and are we all knitting? Bond reminded me last night, we crawled into bed, and she goes, it wasn't knitting. It was worse than knitting. She started crocheting. I'm like, I, I honestly, I could not tell you the difference between those two things, but she's like, it's worse. She starts pulling all the stuff out, and she starts crocheting while he's teaching the Word of God. She's crocheting, and the guy next to her is like ducking from the needle that's like flying like I would, ah, really? Should have punched her in the face. I mean, I'm like, some of you are like, you were like more upset that I just said I should punch her in the face. You're more upset about that than the fact that she pulled out and started crocheting during a Bible study. That's how whacked we've become in what we're to be living out. I, I remember as Gary and Leslie are on their way to Africa, I remember teaching in Africa. I was actually in Malawi, which if you've gone to Nairobi, they're going to Nairobi. It's still a long way. It's a huge continent. It's a long way to get to Malawi. And granted, still about 70% of the folks in Malawi are still living in the village. But I get there to speak, and I'm doing a whole week of pastor training. And it's a small village, but every day, the conference I'm speaking in grows. It gets bigger, more people. And I'm like, I finally ask my host, where are they coming from? And he said, he said oh, Bob, you don't understand. Some of them have walked for days. To come to this days they would die to come to this some people around the world are dying for what we're doing right now and oftentimes totally take for granted like knitting people would die for a page out of your bible just a page out of this. And Peter's like, what, 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 what are we living for? Lewis is, like, Lewis is like, are we training the habit of our faith or just going along like at the fair up and down on a roller coaster of changing moods? I remember a, a gal years ago just sort of waffling on the whole baptism idea. Should I get baptized? Shouldn't I get baptized? And I remember baptizing Bond. We got our kids baptized, and, and one day at a baptism, have I told you this? Bond's in line to get baptized. I'm like, she's not in line to get baptized. She's just, she's tired of waiting for me. She's hungry. It's time to go. It's been a long day. And, uh, and hundreds of people getting baptized, and she's like, no, it's, it's, it's my day. I'm ready to get baptized. Now, she was baptized as an infant, but that doesn't count. I'm sorry, that doesn't, that doesn't count. You don't even remember that day. That was somebody else's decision for you. You need to make a decision, and Bond, my wife, and she got to the point of saying, I'm ready to make that decision. I'm ready to, and so I got to baptize my wife as, lo, uh, as, as well as my kids. It was the greatest honors of my life. And I baptized her in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I brought her up out of the water and immediately kissed her. Started making out. People walking by going, that's a church right there. That, that's a church I'd like to go to. Or just like, mm, Right? But I remember about that time, there's a very renowned family, very well-known family, you know, like North County, well-known family. They're like, Bob, we know you do the baptisms, the courtyard and everything, and the beach, and there are a lot of people in it. Could you just come over to our house, and we'd like to do the baptism, but we'd like to do it private. <laughs> what? What is the point of baptism? What is the point of baptism? To go, so are we like going to continue knitting? Because he's like, it is time to live this out, church. I mean, live it out with intent, knowing that as we do, we are buckling, crippling, like kryptonite. The arguments of the surrounding skeptical world. I would say indisputably, the most skeptical book in your Bible what do you think it is? The most skeptical book has to be Ecclesiastes. 
this guy, right? Turn to it with me for a second. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Let me show you a couple things he does, uh, I think, miraculously say from, from, the, from the pit of despondency. I mean, the pit of despair, the pit of, 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 of just raging in his skepticism, Solomon is. And in chapter 7, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Because I think what he's doing is saying exactly what Peter is saying to us. And he's reminding us that for some of us in the room where living is concerned, it's time to reverse engineer this thing. Like ultimately, where do I want to land? And I just straight up, from the youngest in the room right now to the most senior and mature among us, you don't want to land in looking back saying that was a waste. You want to reverse engineer this thing so that you end well. Okay, and Solomon isn't. If you're having trouble finding it, just open to the middle of your Bible. That's the book of Psalms. And then hang a right just for a few Proverbs and then Ecclesiastes chapter 7. You got it? Say, got it. Look at verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of one's birth. So here Peter's talking about the day of death, the looming day, it's approaching. We don't have very much time left and I don't want to be negligent with the time that remains to stir you up to remind you of these things, even though you know them. And, and here, Solomon's like, here's poetry, Hebrew poetry. He's like, a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of one's birth. Now, we will celebrate the day of one's birth and avoid at all costs as much as we can the day of one's death. I have a dear friend in the church, a dear friend. Add them to your prayer card, not just the camp kids, and not just Guatemala and Mexico and homeless and how to pray for Pastor Bob. But add this. I got a friend in the church now, stage four cancer. Four. And he writes to me. I get weekly updates on how he's doing. And he's actually miraculously and remarkably doing well with stage four. But stage four nonetheless, and I'm writing back. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, Freddie. I'm so sorry. Pray for Freddie praying for Freddie, praying for his wife, love his kids, praying for all of them. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry. He writes me back. He writes me back and he goes, I don't know why you're sorry. You have faithfully for years taught us the word of God and prepared us for this. And I take no credit in that. That's the power of the word of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a guy facing exactly what Peter's talking about, to which now Solomon weighs in on and says, yeah, the death day is better than the birthday. How can that be so? Sounds so morbid. One of my closest friends here in the county, great guy, wonderful colleague, is the chaplain. I'm the chaplain at the FBI. He's the chaplain at the morgue. At the morgue, you're like, what's he do? Captive audience. No, think about it. Think about it. Think about all the loved ones and relatives still living that are pouring in. Now, you and I will avoid that at all costs. That's what he means here. He says, he, he says rather, uh, better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. What? Yeah, better to go to the morgue than to the fair. But we'd all choose the fair. But too much deep fried food at the fair lands you in the morgue. So, so what's the conversation that's taking place in the morgue that makes that day better than the day at the fair? No one's talking about eternity at the fair. No one, they're talking about the bungee cut. They're talking about the roller. In, in the funeral, look what he says here. Look what he's talking about here. Sorrow is better than laughter. Sad countenance. And the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. And the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Heart of fools is at the fair. Better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For like a crackling of thorns. Look at this, verse 6. Like a crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of a fool. So there'll be a lot of bonfires this week. I mean, it's a big holiday week and beaches will be packed and there'll be bonfires. And just picture that now. You can hear that sound? the pallets and the kindling and the in the bonfire and they're crackling away and he's like 
the crackling of the thorns, of the kindling of the branches, the crackling of that is like the laughter of the fool. The laughter of the fool is like, ha, 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 I don't care what he's, what is he talking, it's stupid. Blowing it all off as if life doesn't matter. And the reason he can say that the day of mourning is better than the day of birth is that if you're a believer knowing the best is yet to come, that death is simply a change of address for you and I and we're on our way to heaven. He's simply saying don't waste that because that's the kryptonite of the skeptical agenda. And it doesn't need to be tweaked. You don't need to look at that and go, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's right. I'm going to revise. Don't revise that. That's what they do in Romans 1. Romans 1, we're told, did you read that based on last weekend's message? Romans 1, they twist it, they tweak it, they exchange the truth for a lie. And how many times does God give them up? You know the number of times that God gives them up? He's like, I give up. He gave up on Israel, so don't think it's anything new. He's like, I've tr- I, I give up. The same number of times he gives them up in Romans chapter 1 as the same number of days that Jesus was in the grave. How many days was he in the grave? How many days was Jonah in the belly of the whale? How many times does Jesus say to Peter, do you really love me? Three times he gives them up in Romans chapter 1. You know, there were times in my life where mom and dad did not know what to do with me. Maybe you're on the brink as a parent right now and you're like, Bob, I don't even know what to do anymore. They so much want to go rogue. They so much want to rebel. They so much just want to have sex and get drunk and do what everybody else on campus is doing and living for. I don't even know what to do. I mean, there were times in my mom and dad's life, more my dad than my mom, I got kicked out three times. You're out. Because I just wanted to rebel. There were houses that I wanted to go and spend the night. My mom mom would say, you can't go to that house. You can go to the house next door, but you can't go to that house. Well, if I can go to that house, why can't I go to that house? I want to go to that house. You always want what you can't have. You can go here, but you can't go there. I'm like, why can't I go there? Why can't I go there? Because she knew their parents. And here where I wanted to go, she didn't know their parents. And that house where I wanted to go, that house was a wreck. It was a wreck. So that even when I did, without her knowledge, go there... I couldn't wait to get out. I mean, our next door neighbors, when we were growing up at Forest Home, I mean, for the most part, we were like in this community of people that were working at the camp and everybody was into it, but our neighbors weren't. Our neighbors were like Jethro Tull, flute playing, smoking hippies. But it just, I don't know, at the moment, it seemed so cool. I wanted to go next door. I go, can I go next door? No. But I'd sneak over next door. I mean, eventually, God's like, I just had to, gi- I had to give them up. I had to give them up. And I'm, I'm, I, and I'm just like, oh, that just must have broken your heart, Lord. Because I, I would sneak over there, and I would learn my entire language of swear words in one afternoon, <laughs> see the drugs on the coffee table, smell the pot, and i like, what am I doing here? So all I'm saying to you is what Peter wants really for you to realize is that life is to be lived with intention and not wasted. And as Lewis weighs in, it's not like up and down with the changing of the moods, but it's certain about the training of the habit of our faith so that we wouldn't miss a day knowing that as we live this out, it actually buckles the agenda of the skeptic. It's the kryptonite. Living. Okay, to what intent are you really radically living this out? That it's your aim and your objective and your purpose. Secondly, giving. Giving. If we're living to this intent, are we giving? Giving. And uh, and giving to what percent? And I'm not here to jam you up on the percentages of your giving. I'm just asking to what percent? Because you all think in terms of percentages. You can even go on your iPhone this afternoon and it will give you a rundown of the percentages of where you've spent your time on that device over the course of a 24-hour period. And for some of you, it'll be like, ah, what? So, okay, 
Living to what intent? Giving to what percent? You still in Ecclesiastes? Back up one chapter. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Real quick, look what he says, verse 1. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. Now look at the evil. Look what he says, verse 2. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor. Okay, stop right there. Where does riches come from? What's he say? What's he say? Look what he says. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth. And oh, I don't think God, I think I earned it. See, that's why you don't give. Because you still think it's yours. God gave it to you. God gave you the ability. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that he lacks nothing. There's a North County guy. Lacks nothing for himself so that he lacks nothing for himself of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to eat of it. What does that mean? It means even though he has it all, he's miserable. Even though he has all the things that the world is clamoring for, he's still going to hang himself in his hotel room. He's got everything, yet God doesn't give him the power to enjoy it or to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity, and it's an evil affliction. It's an evil affliction. Why? Here's why. Jesus says, because you can't serve two masters. He goes on here. Look at verse 3. He says, if a man begets a hundred children. Well, that's a lot of kids. We had three. And stopped. This guy has a hundred, but he has 700 wives. Okay, so there's the proportion. Okay, so he's got a hundred kids. If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness... Or indeed he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he. Stillborn child, what's a stillborn child? Dead. I hate that funeral. That's the worst funeral I have to do. Like full term pregnancy, full term dead on arrival. What's he saying? He's saying the guy who has everything, everything, but he isn't satisfied with the goodness, he isn't enjoying it. Stillborn kid, dead kid on arrival is better. For it comes in vanity and departs in darkness, and its name is covered with darkness. And though it has not seen the sun or knows anything, this is the stillborn kid, this has more rest than that man. Wow. 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 Look at verse 6. Even if he lives a thousand years. No, 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 no. Even if he lives a thousand years twice. but has not seen goodness? Does not all go to one place? Where's that place? Well, that's the grave. That's what Peter says is right around the corner for him, and so he doesn't want to be negligent in living his life with intent. Living with intent and giving with percent. So what is the percent? Well, Bob, I don't tithe. You know how many guys have written me in this church and said, I just want you to know straight up, I don't tithe. Okay. Why? Uh, it's not a New Testament principle. It's only in the old. Okay, let's think about that. Because there's a lot that's laid out in the old that's fulfilled in the new. In fact, Jesus said, I haven't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. So uh, here's an example. Where love is concerned, is there more love in the Old Testament or more love in the New Testament? Anyone? You are stoked right now today that there's more love for you in the New Testament than there was ever described in the old there's more mercy mercy more or less mercy in the new testament oh my goodness you're absolutely stoked that there's more mercy in the new testament than there was ever seen in the old testament so where tithing is concerned you think where everything's like tracking up into the right you're like ah no 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 tithing is the floor to which now the more, I'm telling you straight up, the more isn't to put you on a guilt trip. It's simply for you to realize the connection of the more where your giving is concerned becoming the kryptonite of the skeptics because they know this, where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. Well, I'm in, but I don't give. Okay, big problem. Because the giving is the evidence of the living. And Jesus would say, you can't serve both masters. 
In fact, he says it in Matthew chapter 6. We'll put it up on the screens. He says, he says you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to hate the one and love the other, or else you're going to be loyal to the one and despise the other. You know what we want, North County Church? You know what we want? We want to love them both. Kind of do. Okay, let's factor it out. You got two masters. Here's master one. You got master two. He says, uh, one of them you're going to love. Two things right out of that verse, right? Love and be loyal to. The other one you're going to, what? What? Should ask my kids. If you get a chance, ask my kids sometime what their allowance was. You know what it was? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, wow. Uh, yeah, you don't get paid to be in this family. And yet they never went without anything. But see, I didn't want them falling in love with the wrong master. And the only way that I can think of for you not to be addicted to it and controlled by it is to give it away. And again, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about worship. About your soul. The Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? And Forfeit his soul. So maybe where living is concerned, listen, uh, time to reevaluate the intent of what I'm living for. Giving to what percent? Knowing that as that increases, their skeptical argument decreases because it means that you're showing where your heart and treasure are really at. You know, we're going to get we're going to get to Colossians eventually uh, as a church in our study this fall. Colossians, um, and there's a guy introduced to us in Colossians. His name's Demas, and uh, Paul's like all about him. He's like, man, I can't wait for you to meet Demas. Demas is awesome. You get to the book of Acts and the whole record, you know, throughout Acts. He's like, Demas, Demas, he's a rock star. But then you get to the end of Paul's life and he has to write a letter to Timothy and he says, Demas has left me. Demas has departed, falling in love with this present world. That's my fear. Not that we all become demon-possessed. That's not my fear. But that we're demas-possessed. Like, like too much in love with the things of this world to ever really make a measurable difference in how the world views us because of how we're investing, not in our own kingdom. Reverse engineer this with me, you guys, so that you end up where you want to be, in the reshaping of your budgets, so that it isn't God after Netflix subscription and God after iPhone plans and God after your car payment and God after your mortgage and God after all your lattes. It's God first. First fruits. And we're not Demas possessed because if we are, we are giving ammunition for the skeptics to remain skeptical. Thirdly, forgiving. Living to what intent? Giving to what percent? And forgiving to what extent? To what extent? There should be no limits on your forgiveness. Forgiveness should be your go-to. And you're like, Bob, you don't know what's happened. You don't know what they've done. Forgive. Doesn't mean what they did was right. It means you just let yourself out of jail. You just unhooked your own hostage kidnapping. Forgive them. Because your forgiveness of them buckles the skeptic. They're like, what? He did what? Oh, he forgave him. Didn't you hear? He forga she forgave him. That's the last thing the skeptics want to see you do. Because it paralyzes their argument of skepticism. You know, I was thinking, the band's going to come out. We're going we're to celebrate communion now. But I was thinking, if the book of Ecclesiastes is the most skeptical book, who's the most skeptical guy? I and mean, Peter comes close. 
But fortunately, Peter comes around and we're learning a lot from him. Amen? So who is more skeptical than he? And remains stuck in his skepticism. And I think I found it. You know who it is? It's the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. That guy lets his skepticism remain the ruler of his heart and mind and life. And he never comes into the party. He never comes in to celebrate. The dad has to come out of the party and say, son, son, your younger brother was lost and now he's found he was dead. And now he's alive. And the older brother doesn't budge from his skepticism. You know why? Why? Because he refuses to forgive. And the moment you forgive, you freed yourself. And not only have you freed yourself, you have blown a major hole in the agenda of a skeptical society. So take this bread and take this cup and receive his forgiveness, his mercy and his grace, and then extend it. He wants you to forgive as you have been forgiven. And wow, my friends, will that ever rock this community. It'll rock the world when we live with intent and give with percent of saying, Lord, I'm holding nothing back and forgive to the extent that there wouldn't be anything left to be forgiven. You've extended to others the forgiveness that you've received. Because there's nothing that Satan loves more than a Christian that isn't living, that isn't giving, and isn't forgiving. So Lord, we pray right now in the name of Jesus, you would just wash over our minds and our hearts and our lives and our schedules and our priorities, Lord. We bring it before your gracious sacrifice as you took our place on the cross. We bring all that junk to you, Lord. The moody junk that holds us back and gets in the way that piles up. And we, we, we just pray that from here on out, we would live radically with this objective and aim and purpose of being intentional about why we're here. And giving, Lord, giving in such a way that the world would sit up and take notice of, of, of what we're seeing being accomplished, not for our own sake, but believing in the power of the Lord's prayer that thy will be done and thy kingdom will come here on earth as it is in heaven. It's going to take some serious bucks being released and invested in the work of Jesus. Lord, if we've been burned along the way and most if not all of us in the room right now would have to say along the way we have been burned. We have been hurt. The spirit of our heart, Lord, would be to extend forgiveness. May that prayer, Lord, of that new work find its way into our hearts even as we celebrate now of this amazing meal known as the Lord's Supper, this bread that represents your body broken so that our brokenness could be healed and your blood shed so that our sins could be washed as white as snow removed as far as the east is from the west and so do that miraculous work as we praise and sing to your glorious name together at this time of communion to you. Each and every heart. In Jesus' name, amen.